Yay. Welcome, welcome. Yay. Um, so Alexander, I really want you to meet. Femi is part of our COIL community and he is an alumni of COIL. Um, he, uh, Femi did COIL at SUNY Oswego and has gone on to now looking at serving the K-12 community and hopefully um, do COIL in that arena. Oopsie, hold on. Uh-oh, I just pressed the wrong button. Uh-oh, turn that off. Okay. Um, and Friedrich is here from University of Potsdam, um, where he runs the Teaching and Learning Center there. And um, okay, Ohio State. Thank you, Cindy, in the house. So if everybody, Femi and um, Nabila, okay, good, you push your thing. Um, everybody's putting their where they where they're located. Yay. That's wonderful. So I don't I see it. That. I don't see people posting in the chat. Is there? Um, they're they're actually putting it on their um, oh. their little moniker below their. Oh, I see it. I see it. Square. Okay. Oh, I see it now. Yes. Yes. Thank uh -huh. you. Thank yeah. you. I should do that. And um, Betsy's here from uh, California State University, Stanislaus, and um, our Cal State system people are big um, collaborators. So we're thrilled that you're here. Um, and let's see. So I have some questions for everybody as we are starting. Okay, I've got to do a message to this group that because we're not in um, MS Teams, we are here. We are here. We are here. Um, where is that? So I'm going to Look there, um, copy paste. Why are you not showing me? Um, okay, let's get that going. I will share that and come back to this issue. So let me share my screen um, so that Alexandra and Aaron get a better sense of you. Um, and I've started the record button, right? Um, so if you can answer some questions in the chat, is your collaborations mostly online or by video conference? What is difficult about teaching and learning online for COIL collaborations? And what do you think work, works well for learning online? And um, so take a minute to start to think about that and answer those questions. And I am just going to put that here. And let's see if we can take this copy there. Oops, no, I want to paste. I'm having real trouble getting into the MS Good teams. morning. Good morning. Hi, Melissa. Hi, how are you today? Good. How are you? Awesome. We're... I'm pretty good. Hello, everyone. Okay, there is the new message, please. Okay, so for all the people that are in MS Teams, I'm just getting something in there for them. Okay, so. Um, what do we do we have some answers so melissa we're just um giving people a chance to get here and while people are getting here um we are asking um the first question actually um maybe we can even do a show of hands um let's see full course activities especially asynchronous online that's good to hear but lots of optional synchronous sessions. Ooh, that's interesting. Optional, Betsy, how does that work? Can you explain that? Uh, sure. Yeah. yeah, so for optional, um, that will create sessions where the students at, at the partnering campuses can participate live if they're available, but we record them for those who aren't able to do it. So trying to sort of have the best of both worlds. So it might be during what would be a, a normally scheduled class session for one of the, the campuses and and the other ones coming in or 
um, sessions that are at, at just you know special times that that we work to try to get as many people there as possible but to you know recorded and, and and alternative activities to allow those who can't attend live to still be able to fully participate got it that really helps with the equity issue i just wonder if students actually do it um sounds like they do that's great okay okay um all right so if everybody could put their hands in the air if um most of your collaborations um or your professor's collaborations are and i'll stop sharing for a second um are mostly by video conference who is doing mostly by video conference so um, you can do a check okay so cindy is robert is um jayshang uh victor okay so this workshop or this um webinar with alejandra and aaron is for you and i'm thrilled that aaron and um, Alejandra are here today. I'm just gonna share this polling. Again, if you didn't get a chance to answer, please also note what's difficult and what you might have questions about for Alejandra so that she can um, bring that into the conversation today. And um, so let's get started. And I am so thrilled to have Alejandra and Aaron here today. Aaron's going to manage the chat. Actually, I should give you um, some co-hosting um, ability, and I'll do that with you too, uh, Alejandra. And um, so Alejandra started a million years ago and basically started SUNY's online um, world and uh, brought to light the opportunity that um, teaching and learning in the online space could actually bear some amazing fruit that students would have intimate, interesting conversations and learning activities in the online space. And um, I, I just really love all that um, Alex has done for the online community and also developing the Oscar rubric, which has been a great tool for students and professors to help guide them to make their courses more interactive. And um, Alejandra, I hope you also mentioned the DEI project we're working on, because I think that is an actually wonderful component of all of this. And um, I am going to hand it over to you and um take it away thank you thank you hope for um that lovely sort of overview and introduction um and 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 introduction to the folks that are on the call i am so happy to be here to chat with you and to talk with you about how um one can support online learner success um through technology and mediated environments, whether you're whatever modality you teach in, um, if you're using technology, there's lots that can be done um, in those kinds of environments to support online learner success. In, in my opinion, in my view, good teaching is good teaching, no matter what type of environment you're in. And so many of these practices and suggestions apply uh, no matter what modality you happen to find yourself in. Um, of course, my my perspective is focused on the online um, instructor and the online learner. And so when I develop materials and resources for SUNY, and SUNY is an institution with 64 different institutions, it's a, a, a large state um, public university system. And I, Aaron and I work at the system level in the unit SUNY Online uh, that really um, works with all of our campuses, all of our um, faculty and students and instructional designers and directors in lots of different ways. Um, and my um, focus is online teaching. So I work 
primarily with directors of online learning, instructional designers, and, um, and occasionally get to work with faculty directly. Um, over the last 20 plus years that I've been here, um, um, you know, we have worked very directly with faculty, directly with students, and directly really, really with all of the different um, communities of practice that are involved in online teaching and learning. And so we've been around a long time. We have a very large, um, you know, community of folks um, that we have been working with for years. And we, so we know a lot. We've developed a lot to assist faculty and, and students and instructional designers. Um, and so we have a lot of stuff to share. I always try to um, openly license everything that we produce out of uh, this unit. And um, so I'm so happy for the invitation. Thank you, Hope, again, for um, having um, us come and, and talk to your group about this. Um, I think you all have different areas of, of um, interest, maybe different modes that you teach in. And so I'm gonna try to remember to kind of make those connections for you. Um, but keep in mind that my lens and the, the lens of this particular resource is to help online faculty better support success amongst their online students. And, and while the, the definition of online has expanded over time, and especially with COVID, the, the main initial um, uh, audience for us uh, was to work with our asynchronous online instructors and campuses and programs and students. Um, and so, um, so we now have expanded the types of modalities. There's synchronous online, there's hybrid online, which is a blended of face-to-face -face and, and um, and an asynchronous, uh, there may be a blend of face-to-face -face, uh, in the classroom and face-to-face -face online. Now there is uh, something here uh, in SUNY that called HyFlex, um, which is really all of the environments and you get to choose as a student, whichever one you wanna do at any moment in the, in, during the, the, the delivery of the course. So there's lots of now, you know, ways to interact, um, uh, you know, in a technology mediated way, with these varied combinations of instructional models. And so this presentation is intended to help faculty think about and instructional designers think about how um, and what they can actually do to support the success of online learners. And a lot is known um, about what faculty can do to support um, you know, any of their, their students who may be, you know, either asynchronous or at a distance synchronously or, or whatever. And these things that are highlighted, I think are, are pretty, you know, typical. I don't think anyone who's taught online will know that being accessible is important, that um, self-reflection and self-evaluation helps learners to um, understand what helps or hinders their learning, um, that um, maintaining and expressing, articulating expectations really well and in a findable manner um, is super important for, um, for your learners so that they know what is expected of them and, um, and having that rigor associated with those expectations. Um, and then, um, you know, I picked out a couple of other things to highlight, things like recognizing and acknowledging their efforts um, and, and incorporating into that uh, an understanding that often students have competing life priorities, which I think came really to the forward forefront with COVID, where there were a lot of assumptions, I think, initially that were being made um, that really, um, you know, helped faculty to think about about what assumptions and 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 um, what privilege they might have that students um, may not, uh, you know, there, there may be a it may be out of sync between what the assumptions are and what the realities, lived realities are of our learners out there in the wild, so to speak. And then the other thing I highlighted here for us to think about was um, how you can. It's important that. Um, you never really underestimate the power as an instructor in a course that you have to help students to believe in themselves and in their ability to succeed 
in their academic pursuits in general, but in an online teaching and learning environment specifically. And so, um, so that power can be leveraged. There are things that you can do that you can um, reassure students um, and, and help them see and understand that you see them and that you believe in them individually and you believe that they can succeed not only in your course, but in the discipline and in their lives and that this course is going to help them to achieve some of those, whatever those life goals are. Um, so we have tremendous power um, as uh, educators to influence and, and guide the, the dispositions that students have about thinking about themselves and, and how they can be successful. So um, in this presentation, I am going to talk a little bit about that, what instructors can do to support online learners. I'm going to talk about successful, um, you know, what typically successful online learners do, what behaviors they have. And then I'm going to frame up this with a little bit of theory, not a lot, but I want you to understand that it's not just me saying this, that you should do these things or that these things are relevant or important or best practices even, but there is theory underlying all of this. And I'm using that as the framework for showing you some of these practices. And um, that, ha that has to do with um, uh, learner um, self-regulated learning strategies. And um, so first, so let me show you the website, um, which is here. And Erin, I'm sure you've put the link to the website in the chat already. And then I, when we were talking about the things faculty can do, the, that list of things that I have highlighted there, um, I wanted to just point out a couple of resources that you can come and check out um, after the presentation when you have some time and maybe are interested in, in doing more or learning more about some of these things. And so um, we learned through COVID uh, that checking in with students and really trying to understand their circumstances and their situations was really important because if there's something impeding, if they don't have a safe place to stay, if they don't have enough food, if they don't have a stable internet connection, if they don't have machines or, it, you know, um, not only internet connection, but but the, the, the hardware, if they're trying to do your course just on a phone, um, that changes, you know, what they can do and how they can do it and, you know, that, that kind of thing. They can still do it. And I know that all over the world, people are learning just on their smartphones, but, um, but the instructor has to have the awareness of that. So communication is key. Um, at, helping students to help you understand what their circumstances are is important. Making sure that you have um, you know, regular communications in mind before the course starts so that you can plan that out a little bit. Um, all of this serves to promote trust, to create a sense of class community, to um, help students know that you are accessible, as I mentioned um, in, in that list. Um, and um, then also you want to make sure that students know and understand the ways that you would prefer to be communicated with. And that's everything from whether your office hours are virtual or asynchronous or physical, or whether you prefer to be called Dr. Pickett, or whether you prefer to be called Alejandra, or what your pronouns are. All of those things are things that you can communicate with as a as a preliminary thing uh, to your students to help them be oriented and understand, um, you know, um, um, how you are accessible and, and that you care and, and so forth. I have a couple of other resources in this category. This is a syllabus uh, template that I'm just gonna share with you to explore um, at a later time. Some of the unique things about this syllabus template is um, that it is tied to Oscar standards Standards. And Oscar, as Aaron mentioned earlier in the chat, is our online course quality rubric. And we have 50 um, uh, standards, best practices in online course design. And each of the elements in this syllabus refer back to a standard in Oscar. So that's one unique thing about it. The other one is we have a basic needs statement that came straight out of our COVID experience. We have a names and pronouns section, uh, which also really, you know, is representative of our time and our interest in um, 
head on addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion and being inclusive um, and making you know, a safe space for, for, um, for students to express their um, preferred names or their, um, uh, the pronouns that they, uh, that they go by. And then the last thing I want to mention for our US folks um, is regular and substantive interaction. There's a section in this rubric on that. And that is a new Department of Education, US Department of Education, regulation that um, institutions have to um, be able to comply with. And so those are some of the unique things about this, uh, this syllabus that I invite you to explore. Um, in that, in the vein of like demonstrating that you care about your students, I have this little resource that I do at the end of my courses. I ask the students who've just gone through my online course, um, you know, um, what advice for future students like what was what was the experience like for them and so i asked my students that just went through my course to post anything that they like that might help future students um, succeed in the class and so i do that as like a culminating activity in my course i use a tool called padlet it's free and um and then i collect this from the students and then the next semester i post it at the beginning of the class so that the new students to the class can see what the the previous students had to say about their experience in my class and then another way that i communicate how i um how I care about my students is I always send them this love letter. And I'm not saying that you have to do any of these things. I'm showing you what I do as examples. And, you know, if you're not the type of person who would send a love letter to your students, then don't do that. But I do want you to think about how can you express that you um, that you see your students and that you understand things or trying to understand things from their perspective and that you care about them and that you believe in them that they can succeed. So I'm just sharing this um, as, a, as an, an example from my own instruction um, for you just to see an example. All right, so um, I now want to go through um, the little bit of theory that I mentioned and learner self regulation um, is um, not something I made up people have been um, uh, studying this for some time and I have the citation down here at the bottom um, whip and uh, Chiarelli if you're interested in reading the actual paper but there's a lot if you Google self regulated learning, um, you will find lots and lots of research and and stuff out there about it. So what I did was I, I used the strategies and they really um, break down into these categories of, of strategies, forethought, performance, and self-observation, and self-reflection. Those are the main categories of the strategies. And then there are specific uh, strategies in each of those categories, like goal setting and planning, and help seeking, and um, self-judgment. Those are, are subcategories of the self-regulated learning strategies in this model. And so, um, in this column, uh, the traditional column, these are the things that typical um, students in face-to-face -face instructional um, modes uh, will do. And, and they demonstrate that they use these strategies and this, uh, th these strategies represent how they are successful uh, because they do these things. So in forethought, a traditional student will use calendars and organizers and will self-impose deadlines and they'll organize their work into chunks and so forth. And so then I, I um, documented a little bit of, of some ad adaptations that online learners could um, adapt in order to demonstrate um, attending to this uh, goal setting and planning uh, self-regulated learning strategy. So logging in daily, coordinating the work that they have to do online and offline, planning in advance for technical problems, those kinds of things can come under um, those um, adaptations that a successful online learner would do. And so I have this for, for all of them, you know, a little brief blurb about you know what a traditional student in a face-to-face -face class would do and some of the the things that the online students uh, would need to adapt in order to um, to also demonstrate um, um, using this strategy successfully um, so that's my little brief overview of the of the theory 
Um, and now what I'm gonna do is um, actually go through um, the actual strategies uh, that we have. So here they all are, and you can see um, when you click on each one of these things, they unfold to show um, um, the additional, uh, you know, all of the strategies are represented there, in other words. So let's look at goal setting and planning first. And you can see that, you know, procrastination, if you've taught a fully online course before, or even, you know, in, in, in yourself as a learner, there may be things that you will procrastinate about. And um, it, it's a typical human, um, you know, foil, fo foible. Um, but in an online course, if you procrastinate, it's going to make things very difficult and challenging for you. If you get behind, it's very difficult to catch up. So successful students, um, um, whether you're online or offline, um, do things to help them stay on track. They set goals and they plan. And so there are these types of things that a successful blended remote or online uh, learner um, does. Um, they focus on time management, they um, check daily, um, they spend time planning. Um, they'll actually plan, you know, in, if they're having a class discussion, they'll plan, they'll pick out a point that they want to if they're called upon or if they have the opportunity to bring up in the course of the of the course. So they they do all of this kind of prep work. Um, and so um, so what faculty can do, um, I have some resources I want to share with you. So the first one has to do with time management. And this resource is from Penn State, and it's a tutorial. And um, I, I'll show you the main site for this um, in, in a little bit, but they have a bunch of tutorials and they are really right in line with what we're talking about in terms of supporting learners to develop these skills. Time management is a skill and um, you can develop that skill and, um, and you can also not have that skill yet. So it needs development. So this tutorial is something I would recommend that you take a look at and see if there's something that you might um, be able to adopt from it or, or adapt from it or maybe even use. It's just a, a simple um, set of activities that learners can do in order to improve in time management. And this ties back to the self-regulated learning strategy of goal setting um, and, um, and yeah, of goal setting. So the other two resources I wanna point you to, one is called Remember the Milk, and I love it because it's like a little cow and it's su super cool. So it's really just an app that you can um, that, an, that anyone can use and students could use to help themselves stay on track, to remember that they have a post due or they remember that they have to attend a, a, a synchronous session or to remember, you know, they can just go through it with their calendar and mark things so that they will get them, they will give themselves a text. An instructor can also use this tool to broadcast to their students um, things that they want the students to know or to remember. The other tool is called Remind. And so these are just two tools that will do that. You should probably check with your instructional designer um, or your institution or your tech folks to see if these, um, um, functionality, if the functionality exists within your learning management system already, you don't need to go use a different tool. If you already have mechanisms built into your, either your institution or your, your learning management system. But those are just two cool tools I've seen faculty use and that I thought I would share with you to check out if you were interested. All right, the next area has to do with organizing and transforming organizational materials. So you know that effective, good, um, not good, but what's the word I'm looking for? Successful students uh, will manage and organize their materials to maximize their success in, in they'll spend time doing this. Um, and so some things that they might do are things like printing out um, materials, um, marking so that they can mark it up, or maybe they'll use an online um, um, annotation tool to do that straight online. Uh, they might also um, be really good note takers. And believe it or not, note taking is a skill, right? There are some ways to do it better than other ways. And so knowing and understanding your own skills, as well as understanding what 
you know, activities and skills could improve how you're already taking notes uh, is, um, is an important thing. So, um, so let me show you a couple of the resources I have here. Back in that same uh, Penn State uh, um, tutorial uh, section, they have a whole little tutorial on note taking. So you could look through these activities and see if you want as a nice breaking activity for your learners to um, have them do one of these activities, or you might want them to do the whole thing. Um, you know, it's just something that you can do as an instructor to support improvement in this particular um, self-regulated learning strategy, which is associated with um, note-taking. And I mean, note-taking is associated with the higher one, which is organizing and transforming um, instructional materials. So a couple of other tools to share with you uh, that may or may not make sense or be relevant to your discipline or to the level of your course, but just to show you, uh, Zotero is an excellent tool if, if you're teaching, for example, if they have to write a research paper and you want them to be able to organize their citations easily and well. Zotero is a wonderful tool to assist with that. It does a lot of other things too, but that's uh, a primary um, uh, feature of it. Hypothesis you may already be uh, familiar with is a wonderful way to be able to annotate web pages. So if someone's reading an article that's on the, that's already on the web, they can actually make notes and, and you can make notes and, and um, uh, as the instructor and, and share them and and collaborate on them. Um, Hypothesis is a wonderful um, a web annotation tool. This is the accessibility. Sometimes people have questions about the accessibility of these tools. So I'm showing you that for, for Hypothesis. The one that I love and use is called Digo. And so you see back on this page where I have things highlighted, those things are highlighted with this tool called Digo, which I really, really love. It does more than, it's like a social bookmarking tool. So here is my Digo group for my course and everyone in my class has to bookmark anything that they share in my course in this group. They have to bookmark it and share it to this group. And so we're collaboratively creating an annotated bibliography of resources that are not just shared with the students in my current course. They're shared with every student that has ever taken my course. So we're building community that spans um, semesters. And it's just a really nice way to keep connected and to continue to talk about things uh, that we have mutual interest in. Um, I have this uh, page, it's a blog post that I wrote about why I love Digo, and so you might be interested, you know, in why I do it. I, I use it in a couple of different ways to present content, to facilitate uh, interaction and collaboration, and then it, I can also use some of the features that make me more efficient in giving feedback to my students and, and so forth. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that, but if you're interested in more details about how you might use a social bookmarking tool um, in your instruction. I have like a recipe for that and where I talk in detail about what I do, why I do it, and then I have a whole section on how to do it and some examples. Um, so you can come back to this resource if you're interested in, in learning more about that and kind of mind that um, that um, that recipe card. <laughs> All right, let's go on to the next one. This is about structuring the learning environment. And um, we know that successful students in general will um, really pay attention to how they structure their study space. And so face-to-face -face students do this as well, but in an online um, course where you don't have a physical building or a physical classroom to go to, you do that from wherever it is that you are. So an online student will, um, you know, take the time to think about this, how do I go to class? Like, what does that mean for me? And they will arrange their settings to make learning, um, you know, easier, more effective, more efficient for themselves. Um, so they think psychologically, they have a time frame that is blocked off. And so this is when I'm going to class. So their family knows I'm in class right now. I may be in my bedroom, 
or I may be at the kitchen table, but this is my class time. Um, and so psychologically, they have set that for themselves. And then they may also set things up so that it feels more like they are going uh, to class or so that they have everything that they need. They eliminate distractions. They have a snack. They have some water nearby. They think about when they're going to take a break. They, they think about how much time am I going to sit here before I take a break. Um, and they schedule that. And they also think about about their computer, um, the you know, it, it make sure that it they make sure that it is um, you know up to date with everything that it that your, their internet is stable, those kinds of things. Um, so some of the resources I want to share. Oh, here is the um, main page of that Penn State. Um, resource. They have so many wonderful tutorials here um, that you can just, each one has a tutorial, each one of these things, active listening, brainstorming, um, um, diversity, conflict management, each one has a tutorial. So you can come here and take a look and see if any resonate for you. But for this strategy, um, I was thinking that this one made a lot of sense uh, as an ice breaking activity to get students to think about if they are ready to learn online. Your institution may do something prior to them getting into your class. They may do some online readiness inventories or surveys or whatever to help students understand what they're getting themselves into. But there may be something that you could do as an ice breaking activity to help students start to think about um, this self-regulated learning strategy, which is around structuring their environment. Have they really you know, thought through what it's gonna mean for them to study online? Then I have this resource here um, that uh, are some tangible things that um, folks can do, that students can do to organize um, their study space. And so finding a quiet space, creating that space to be effective, a space for studying, making sure that they are comfortable, they have a good chair or they're sitting in, in a way that is not going to, you know, cramp you know, get cramps from it and they organize all of their online materials and files or even if they're face to even if they're tangible files like I have, um, they schedule their time, they spend time with the calendars and setting up alerts and so forth, they stay organized so they have a system and they maintain that system of of keeping their files and their materials um, organized they have a routine they've thought about their support system do they do do their does their family know and support them so that they can go to class and and not interrupt them during those times so those are some things to think about and consider helping your online students develop these skills and the, the awareness of of the need to do some of these things in order to increase the likelihood of their success in your online instruction is what the instructors can do so um, so hopefully those resources can help you think about that more and what you could do in your own instruction, regardless of the modality. So the next area is help seeking. And this area is, um, is really, really interesting and important. Um, you know, good, successful online students and any student, no matter the modality, will ask for help if they need it. And they'll ask for help from instructors, they'll ask for help from their classmates, they'll go to the appropriate office if it's a student support that they need. Um, they will seek out the the tutors and the, um, the, the help that is available um, at the institutional level for student supports, they just, they, they do that. They avail themselves of those supports and make use of the folks in the class to assist them if they don't understand do something you know. or if they need additional help. Um, so what faculty can do is to make sure that there are explicit instructions, to make sure that students feel comfortable um, asking for clarifications or asking for help to provide office hours in whatever modality that might be. It might be an online asynchronous, um, you know, private chat, or it might be, um, um, you know, a virtual office hour, or it might be a face-to-face -face office hour, but, you know, making sure that the students know that there is this option for getting help available. You can also promote students helping each other. Um, in my course, I have an, a, a simple discussion that is called, um, 
ask a question. And the ask a question area is um, I, the way that I set it up with the instructions. Anyone can ask a question. It's public and anyone can answer the question. So I'm actually promoting students to express their teaching presence in a course by helping other students. And I'm in that section also. So it's not like I ignore it or anything. I, I might respond in it, but I'm really promoting students to, to ask questions and to help each other. And they might be more they might be more apt to ask a question if they think they're asking it of their peers, then they might to come and find me and, and ask for help from me. And there's lots of reasons for that. Um, in fact, um, you know, the challenges that first generation college students face are enormous and um, help seeking is one of those self-regulated learning strategies that um, first gen students struggle with. It's very difficult for them already to be a first gen student. Um, there are psychological challenges that they face, uh, including what I have highlighted here, guilt and shame and confusion. I'm using Digo, by the way, to highlight these things. And you can see I left myself a little sticky note here um, on this particular one in part to demonstrate this tool. So I, I can leave myself little notes. And if I share it with my class, my class would be able to see this little note that I left for them. And this is just a plain public website that I found. And only I and my students would be able to see this. Like if you go to this page, you won't see these highlights. Um, unless you were in my group, I would have to add you to my group and you would have to be in Digo. But anyway, um, back to the first gen students, they, um, they have a lot of, of challenges um, they may arrive uh, not as prepared as other students. They may find all of the academic stuff very overwhelming and they have nobody that they can ask because if they're first gen, their parents didn't go to college. Um, they already may come from some disadvantages in terms of, of, uh, of income and, and prior you know, learning. Um, and they might feel more isolated um, in part due to the financial issues they might experience and in part because they just don't know how to navigate the, the, um, any of the, you know, not just academic, but also social activities. They might just not know about how, how to get to the student activities calendar and find the activities that are going on, right? That they could be part of. And then they don't want to appear stupid. So if often they'll ask, they won't ask a question because they don't want to appear like they don't know. So um, helping people to feel more comfortable across the board is a really good strategy to assist students in that so developing that self-regulated learning strategy of help seeking and not feeling, um, you know, feeling like, like they are, are able to reach out for help when they need it and how to do that. So the more that you can do as an instructor to make that transparent and clear to the learners, the better it will be for them. So self-monitoring and record keeping are also is the next self-regulated learning strategy I wanted to focus on. And this is, you know, whether you're a face-to-face -face student or a you know, synchronous student or an online student, um, the, the, the successful ones will track their grades and will track their assignments and will keep very close track, will self-monitor. If they don't do well on this quiz, they think, okay, I need to get this on the next quiz in order to account, account for that and to not dip below the grade that I'm trying to get, right? So they, they're very proactive and deliberate about taking those, um, those actions and monitoring how they are doing on their um on their assignments and they will seek help if the you know the second that they don't get the grade that they desired they will go to the instructor and ask for help and say how can i can i do some extra credit to 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 um, you know lift my grade or i didn't understand this at all can you please help me understand this and and so those are the those are the ones who are really successful in this particular strategy so what faculty can do to help learners um one of the things that i wanted to highlight here there's lots of stuff in in this one but one the, the main thing I wanted to do was to um, recommend rubrics. If you're not currently using rubrics, I want to highly recommend that you talk with an instructional designer or get um, educated about how your um, learning management system supports rubrics um, and to implement them. And I would implement them wherever it's possible because from the student perspective, it really helps them to understand what you are evaluating and at what levels 
And so they will know specifically in this assignment, if I do this in this way, this is the grade, I, this is the points or the grade I'm gonna get for this. And so rubrics are an incredible tool to help students um, self-monitor and, and to meet your expectations because they, they may not know, they just might not know what you're looking at, at looking for. So here's an example of my discussion grading um, rubric. And again, I am not telling you that you should do this in your course at all. I teach a graduate level course and I and the one of the main aspects of my course is online interaction and I'm very persnickety about what I am looking for. I don't care about students' opinions unless they can support it with research. Their assumptions and their biases all come into their uh, opinions and what I want them to do is to really um, if they have an assertion, I want them to be able to report it with scholarly work, not with somebody's random newsletter. I want, you know, <laughs> I want them to really be able to support it. And again, my course is a graduate course, so I am looking for very specific things. And so I'm giving this to you. I'm sharing this with you only as a as a as an example of mine. Um, I also have on this page. Um, down at the bottom, I have a bunch of resources on rubrics. So I invite you to come and take a look at these resources. There are examples in other disciplines and at other levels other than, you know, mine was graduate, there's other levels of types of rubrics, uh, depending on Bloom's. Like if you're not familiar with Bloom's taxonomy, an introductory course is down at the bottom and the level that you're going for is maybe understanding and, you know, in some ways regurgitation. You want them to, to, to know and understand the basics of whatever your course is. At my level, I'm asking them to apply <laughs> and, um, and, and, you know, and further. So, uh, so you wanna have your rubric targeted. You wanna know for a fact that your rubric is targeting not only the, the, the level on Blooms, but a variety of levels, not just the understand level. You wanna move them incrementally forward. Uh, so, uh, so a lot of these tools will help you uh, to, to, to do that and to figure that out. Um, all right, let's go to the next one, which is self-reflection. And um, so effective and successful students of any type really think about how they learn and what they're learning and what's helping and hindering their learning. And, um, and they will make um, accommodations, they'll make changes based on on their self-reflection, right? If something is hindering and they can do something about it, they will. Um, so, um, so what can faculty do to help learners uh, self-reflect? I have some resources for you um, to, to take a look at. And if you haven't heard about this Tea for Teaching uh, podcast, I would highly recommend it. It's very well done by one of our um, uh, folks in SUNY, uh, but it's known you know, nationally and internationally as a really excellent um, podcast. So th this particular one um, I'm recommending for this particular strategy strategy so that you can learn a little bit more about um, um, metacognition in online discussion. Uh, and it's with our friend um, from Genesee Community College, Judith Littlejohn. So I, I encourage you to take a listen. Uh, I also have um, an example of how I do it in my own instruction, all my students have to blog. And the blog is a self-reflection. It's essentially, they keep a metacognitive journal for every module in my course, I have them reflect. And I give them prompts, I give them discussion um, I give them prompts for, for guiding their reflection for each of my modules. And so um, my students typically initially hate the blogging activity. Um, and so I wrote this post um, explaining to them why I want them to blog. And, um, and then I have a, another recipe card for you on um, you know, this whole practice and how I do it, what I do and why I do it and what tools I use and then how I do it. And you can see here, these are my prompts for each of the, for each of the 
modules in my course, I have a series of prompts that, that I give to them that they can use or not. If they don't need a prompt, then they don't have to use my prompts. But for those students who need some prompts, I give them these prompts for each of my modules. So you can take a look at what some of those are. Again, not saying you have to do this, just giving you some examples of some practices that I know are effective in supporting this particular self-regulated learning strategy of self-reflection. All right, so the next one, which I think is our last one. No, we have two more. Self-efficacy um, is, is the next one. And this really has to do with having students and supporting students to believe that they can actually succeed. And we already talked about this a little bit, um, but um, some of the things that, that faculty can do um, is to create a supportive online environment where students are really believing that they are seen by you and by others in the class and that everyone um, supports them and believes that they can actually succeed. So you can model behaviors, you can demonstrate um, and encourage learners in lots of different ways. And you can uh, also support this strategy by providing very clear expectations and instructions. So some of the resources that I pulled out for you for this one is calculating time on task. If you teach an entirely online course, you may struggle with how much work is enough. And, uh, and am I doing a course in a half? or maybe you are doing a course and a half. And so time on task is a really important thing to understand um, in, in the design of your course so that you don't have unrealistic expectations of the, of the learners and so that you really know and understand what you're doing. And so um, I, this is new. I've updated this, this uh, resource recently. And so, um, you know, in, in the US college undergraduate system, a three credit course um, typically is 15 weeks. And, and so the number of hours that you're shooting for in an online course for work, both online and offline is 135 total hours of work. Work. And so I have it broken down here by credits um, and by numbers of hours um, per week, as well as by disciplines. And then I also did it for, for graduate level courses, which obviously is going to be a little bit more higher expectation in terms of hours, right? So hopefully this can give you some, um, some you know, numbers to shoot for. Again, it's not like black and white, but it helps you to understand if you look at it and you say, oh, I have 200 hours of work here, you're going to want to scale that back a little bit. Or if you only have 25 hours of work here, you're going to want to bump that up a little bit. So this other tool that I want to share with you is an estimator. Um, this one is by Wake Forest University. It's very good. And you come in here and you plug in things like, you know, how long your class is, how much they have to read, what is the difficulty and the purpose. You, and I filled this one out already. Um, and uh, so then if you move Move things around, for example, look at the total estimates here. If you move things around, it's going to affect the total hours here. So you can start to get an, a sense of how much work it's going to take for them to do independently and how much, um, how many contact hours or the, 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 anal the, what's the word I'm looking for? The analogous, um, representation of contact hours if you're not meeting synchronously. So, um, so yeah, I, these two tools, I think, can, can help you clarify some of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is, was that in this section? It has to do with growth mindset. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the next one as well. But I, this is probably a K-12 resource, but really helping students to think about not that they are smart or that they are good at something, because those are fixed mindset uh, constructs. You want to really think help them think about, okay, maybe you didn't do well on this particular quiz because you don't really understand the material yet, but here's an option and an opportunity to review the material and to retake the quiz and you can improve. If you put time in and effort in and work in, you can improve. And so that's the whole notion behind fixed and, and growth mindset. So you want to try and promote, these are 10 good strategies for promoting mindset. And uh, so you can adapt these, I think, to your, to your own instruction and think about it. I mean, I think partly 
many of us grew up in a fixed mindset environment. And so it's kind of ingrained. It's our, it's kind of our default. And so I would encourage you to really think about that and question your own um, assumptions and your own possible biases in this area so that you can begin to adopt language that will um, be more helpful to supporting this notion of self-efficacy in your students, of this notion of I can do this, I can be successful, I am not bad at math, I just need to practice more, right? There's no such thing as being bad at math. That's not true. Anyone can learn math if they practice and have guidance and get feedback and get the opportunity to do problems. Um, so, so that's that one. The next one is goal orientation and interests um, and attribution. So in this one, um, you know, um, this really has to do with um, more specifically the growth mindset that I was just talking about. How is what I'm studying, um, how can I be successful in that? And, and what does it take to be successful? And how can I associate what I'm doing in the class to my real life and my goals? Or um, you know, how does this relate to my real lived experiences and, and what kind of effort and focus is it gonna take for, to help me to be successful in this? So that growth mindset, um, those, those growth mindset um, practices and skills um, are important for you to know and understand so you can support those in your students. And it's important for your students to get their, um, to, to get their thinking um, in line with this. So, um, you know, this is 25 ways to develop a growth mindset. So I'd encourage you to take a look at this and, um, and to see how it plays out in your own thinking as well well as how do you express that potentially either positively or negatively in your own instruction and think about ways that you might be able to improve students developing a growth mindset. The other tool I have here, or website I have here that's informational is 15 ways to build a growth mindset. And I have highlighted here um, some of the differences between fixed and growth mindsets so that you can get clearer on you know what this actually means and looks like and so in you know for example effort um you know in in a fixed mindset effort really doesn't come into play you're either good at something or you're not and um and so effort doesn't factor in but in a growth mindset the more effort you use or the more effort you take the more um successful and and more you'll understand and the more you'll learn uh and so forth um you know mistakes and feedback is an important one um you know you think that you take the quiz and fail and then you give up that's fixed mindset because you think you're not you can't learn it, That's, you're just not that type of person. Uh, in a growth mindset, you see it as a lesson to learn from. So you understand that there are, that you didn't understand some things. And so you have to go back and figure out what you didn't understand, get help and then improve and take the, you know, take the quizzes again or, or you know, do some extra work in order to, uh, to actually uh, to get that. So uh, those are just resources for you to, to you know, check out. Um, this one here, um, I wanted to focus on um, to really help you think about diversity, equity, and inclusion as part of this whole process of supporting online learner success. There are so much that we can do um, in our own um, instruction and in the design of our online um, activities and interactions with students that can support success. And so it's not just about you know, the, your discipline and how, how you present content and how you facilitate interaction and how you provide feedback. There, it, it, it's nuanced and it's layered. And this whole notion of diversity, equity, and inclusion is not separate from those things. There are ways that you can pre present content that is exclusive of some of the people in your course and some that is more inclusive. So think, I want you to think about those things. And, and, and it's not just that, it's also in collaboration and, and interaction. Who do you interact with most in your class? Um, and it's also in the feedback that you give. 
you know? So think about how it's not separate. DEI is not separate from online quality or online course design or online teaching or online learning. It's integrated into it. And so I want you to think about it and, and look for opportunities in your instruction um, and in your course designs to, um, to be more inclusive, to think about these issues of, of access and equity. And so these resources, there's a ton of stuff here. And so I'm gonna encourage you, there's, there's even tools down here at the bottom somewhere, there's tools um, that you, you, can, you can put your syllabus materials in this one and it'll tell you how gender balanced your, um, your readings are for your course. There's, there's all kinds of, uh, oh, I love this one too, the, the guys generator. So it's, I often will say guys and I try not to, but what this does is it gives you alternatives um, to saying um, hi guys. And it's, it's just a, a simple little generator just to think about and, and to um, um, you know, play around with. So that's it, that hope, that's what I had for <laughs> you all. And I know there's a ton of stuff in the chat. Um, so I am you know, here and I, you know, if anyone has a question, I would love and hope I see that you asked for five minutes for questions and I sucked up all the time. It's one <laughs> o'clock. I'm sorry about that, but I'm happy to take any questions. Okay. Well, first we need to give you a big round of applause for just a giant fire hose of information and um, really, really wonderful. And um, seriously, if anybody has any um, reflections or um, feedback or thoughts, um, please give a share or um, throw it in the chat. Uh, it really is so perfect for the COIL community to think about these things because um, we know that it's not just about the video conference. It's about really going deep in the um, asynchronous space. So thank you, Alejandra, for really helping us to get to that. Um, Gabby, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Gabby Mendes. And Alejandra, not a question, but just to thank you for sharing all these wonderful resources with the community. Because um, some of you already know that I'm passionate about this topic, the online learning and instructional design. Uh, but I think that what you have shared today with us really help us to also think about how can we include this kind of recommendations into our co collaboration and how we can we can use some of the materials to um, enhance the, the student experience when we start collaborating with other people in the online. <laughs> Right, and I think we have an opportunity to take that Digo tool um, and maybe even start bookmarking together for some of these resources to share with the, the community. So Gabby, that's a really good, you know, making the connection with the online learning and the COIL, COIL approach. So thank you for bringing that Muchas up. Muchas gracias. Gabriela, me, <laughs> quiero hablar un poquito en español para que sepas que uh, mi mamá era colombiana, entonces yo sí hablo un poco de español y, y bueno, encantada de conocerte y a todos que hablan español. Muchas gracias, Alejandro, un gusto. <laughs> Great. Anyone else has a reflection or um, something that was a robust um great conversation and great comments happening in the chat if you didn't get a chance to see and um so as aaron has noted a couple times if you do want the chat click on the three dots at the bottom to save it um, to your local drive and um thanks again aaron for uh backing up alejandra and alejandra thank you so much for all these great goodies. And um, so I'm also going to suggest if this really rings true for you to think about all this, as Gabby noted, we do talk about technology and COIL in our idea hub that meets the first Friday of the month at 11 a.m. Eastern time and that you can adjust that for wherever you're located. But, um, and we also will talk about this in coordinator calls and in our workshops, because 
this is a huge topic to keep going. Yeah, Friedrich, you have your hand up. Oh, you're leaving. Okay, bye bye. All right. Anyone else want to just jump in and say something? Ah, Friedrich said tons of ideas and materials. Great. Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you. Hope the other thing I wanted to mention was yeah. we'd like to invite anyone to join as a friend of SUNY. Mm -hmm. um, and that way, you know, if you're interested, um, you can get some communications from me and from Aaron about things that, um, you know, like this. Um, it's a simple URL if you're interested. Right. In it. And the other thing was wow. our Facebook group, if you're interested in joining our our uh, Facebook group. Oh, I, I think that's yeah. it. That's it. So Great. anyone is welcome, regardless of, you know, if you're interested in online teaching and learning, we invite you to join those things. Wonderful. Yeah, because, you know, if you have good hands on um, activities and projects, then the students are really thrilled and into it. And it really makes a difference. Um, anyone else all righty well thank you so much yay another thank round you. of thank applause you thank yay. you all. it was lovely to meet you all and to be here with you and thanks to aaron and to hope for everything and um yeah hopefully see you online sometime absolutely and um hopefully join up to go to some of the online teaching webinar series all right i'm gonna stop um, recording.